I do not think we should so lightly abandon the outer defenses. Defenses that your brother long held intact. Um, the things that Denethor says here, they are actually in the book and they were set in front of a whole council um, where they, uh, where all the forces of Gondor from all the areas met together. And um, so this was quite a, quite an embarrassing thing, but it's, it's not said that he's eating while everything's happening. So the way that it's depicted here is a bit more disgusting and, and yeah, just vile to see. Also in the book, it's not about the defense of Osgiliath or reclaiming of Osgiliath. Nobody believes that this is possible. Instead, what they're doing is they are defending the outer forts, which, um, which are part of the large uh, wall around Minas Tirith, which is very, so large that it's very difficult to defend against a strong assault. And that is where Falamir gets later wounded. So the scene that's about to be shown, where Smeagol spoils the food and throws it away, um, that is not in the book at all, because there's no disagreement between Frodo and Sam. But what is happening is that right before the tunnel, they rest and Smeagol goes ahead. And what he's doing in the book is he's warning Shelob that tasty hobbits are going to come through the tunnel. And in the meantime, Frodo and Sam talk about the things that were at the end of the movie of the Two Towers, which is the story of Samwise the Brave and Frodo and the Ring and uh, comparisons between what they are living through now and what they heard in stories. And something that is quite a key moment in the book, but is only hinted at in this scene, is that when Sam wakes up again, he sees Gollum patting Frodo because Gollum is on the verge of repenting and yeah, being disappointed by himself that he actually went through all this evil to get to the ring. He just startled me as all. Well. So this is the moment that Smeagol almost tells them that they shouldn't go through the tunnel or warn them of the trap or whatever he did. And when Sam is so aggressive, he changes his mind again and the moment is lost. No, you're not all right. You're exhausted. So something that's quite interesting about the scene that they shot here, apart from the thing that it's completely against the law, um, is that uh, the close-ups, the pickups that you see where Sam's mouth is moving and where Frodo is in close-up, um, they are one year apart. So the one was shot at the beginning of the shooting and the other one at the end of the production. And they were shot in the same area, in the same hall. It's a bowling hall, I think, where they created the rocks and the climbing area and the stairs and everything. And um, the consequence of that was that the bowling hall that they rented for, I think, four weeks or something, actually was inactive for a year and the bowling club, club had to go somewhere else. This was due to different delays that they had in the production. The set of Minas Tirith was actually created in the same quarry that they created Helm's Deep before. Um, so there were a few months difference in between and then they had the whole set standing. And then you have, of course, the miniature, which was a gigantic piece of detailed work. Um, the song that you hear in a minute is actually composed by Billy Boyd, who is, I think, a singer. And the text is from a poem that Tolkien wrote and is, I think, part of the Lord of the Rings. He suggested to Peter Jackson that he could sing a song and create it himself. And they only took one take where Billy Boyd was singing the whole song and all the reactions and emotions that you see um, are completely authentic. And you have the whole crew and everybody on set crying when uh, Billy Boyd was finished. Six thousand spears. Less than half of what I'd hoped for. In the book, they actually assemble 11,000 soldiers. So they have more than the whole army of Isengard was. And um, you see that Saruman could only win or try to win because of the power that he held over the king and the way that Rohan wasn't even fighting. But in the books, they actually have to leave 5,000 in Rohan for the defense of the Rohirrim borders. And there's actually a battle near the Falls of Rauros where the Ents and the Rohirrim together um, defeat the army of Sauron that is coming and it attacks there. That is the road to the Dimwald, the door under the mountain. 
So they, they give a lot of names for this path. And in the book, the whole chapter is named the paths of the paths of the dead. And it's quite ironic that in the theatrical cut, they didn't say the name a single time. And in the extended edition, they only say it once. And instead, they say all kind of different names, like the door under the mountain. And this was quite irritating during the during watching it in the cinema. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But why would they use so many different names if not uh, use the one that everybody uses? It isn't all that dangerous. It's not even sharp. So Mary, at this point, still has the dagger, for him a sword, that he was given by Tom Bombadil at the Barrow Downs, where the, um, the barrows of the kings or warriors of Arno were, and where all the swords had been forged precisely to fight against spirits in the service of the Witch King of Angmar. The statues that you see here, the weather-worn ones, are the Puke men. Um, these statues were made by the men who lived in the mountains, and I don't mean the ones who are cursed and the spirits, but the ones that are shown in the, only in the books as still living in some very enclosed forest spaces near the White Mountains, and they are called the Druadan, the Wild Men. And they are actually an ancient uh, people that is friendly towards the Free Peoples, but that is not related to any of the, uh, of the, of the men that are Gondor and Rohan. So um, they used to live all, in all the parts of the White Mountains. So in the book, she's not dying at all, and Elrond never comes and visits Aragorn. But as I mentioned earlier, there is a message from Elrond via the other Dúnedain to Aragorn, and so it makes sense to some degree. This is actually the moment where in the cinema they made a pause, because in all the Lord of the Rings movies the length was too long to put it, at least in Germany, for a, for an audience in one piece. And um, I remember how confused I was that it was so early. It's like after a third of the movie, they had a pause and then everything else is one continuous stream. They fled, vanishing into the darkness of the mountain. And so Isildur cursed them. So the people who dwelt in the mountain, they swore fealty to both Isildur and to Sauron. And, uh, you know, one after the other. So when Sauron came back and returned and grew powerful again, they did not want to fight for Isildur against Sauron. And so they actually kind of did an, a decent thing to stay neutral. I mean, nobody has cursed Switzerland to die just because they stayed neutral. Or to never die. So, um, yeah, Isildur cursed them. And this is something that belongs to the idea of men not being able to die, they become a spirit or a kind of wraith. And uh, yeah, it's just not the right thing for them. They need to escape the world. Contrary to the elves, who are bound to the world as long as the world endures. None of my riders can bear you as a burden. I want to fight! I will say no more. <laughs> He's told the same thing in the book. And in the book, he's then taken on by the company of one called Danham, and he does not recognize until the middle of the battle that it is actually Eowyn. But here in the movie, they, I mean, because it's so easy to distinguish her, her features and her voice, they just made it obvious from the beginning. This shouting of the orcs, that was also, um, the Urukai were also shouting for Saruman uh, when he had the speech. This was recorded in a cricket stadium in New Zealand, where in the break between the first and second half of the game, Peter Jackson and his sound crew asked the, the whole audience, which were I think 20,000, to chant Black Speech, and that is what they recorded then and used. I see shapes of men. And of horses. In the book, they have the 20, is it 20? They have the 20 Dunedain and the three from the Fellowship going through the tunnel. And they actually pass through unhindered. And um, they also find one of the former kings of Rohan, or better, one of the sons of the former kings of Rohan, who had once made a bet 
that he would dare to cross the path of the dead and they find him uh, dead lying there without any any actual uh, wounds or anything, just just dead. And so they, they pass through, they meet at one of the ancient stones that is in the southern part of Gondor, and it is there that Aragorn speaks to the dead, but nobody can see the dead, right? So they're not visible as in the movie. And then the dead agree to help them, they go to the ships, conquer the ships, and then the task is done because Aragorn tells them that as soon as Gondor's, Gondor's southern regions would be uh, secured, they would be free. And it's with the large, power, uh, large hosts that Gondor has prepared in the south to defend against the pirates, which again, Denethor knows they're coming because he has a plant here. Aragorn takes these hosts gathers them on the ch on the ships and then goes up north and uh, comes to the aid of Minas Tirith. The dead do not suffer the living to pass. So with the uh, the ghosts, they made it so that when the, the ghosts are angry, you see more of the skull. And when they are less angry, you see more of the actual skin and muscle. Also, the filmmakers were quite disappointed when, before The Return of the King came out at cinema, uh, they saw Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one, um, come out with also having dead ghost skeletons. And so Pirates of the Caribbean, Caribbean was first, and uh, Return of the King was afterwards. Not too bad an archery form from Legolas at this point, though it wasn't very clean. The sound effects that they made for the skulls are composited of many different things falling and the very high-pitched one is actually lots of walnuts falling. I think they had thousands of walnuts that they had rolling down and they recorded that sound among some of the more darker sounds like bigger blocks of stone. I think also coconuts were involved but I'm not too sure. The burning place that you see is the haven of Pelargir, uh, an ancient um, haven of the Numenorians, where especially uh, the elven friends would go very far to the north compared to the other havens like Umbar that the Numenorians built that were closer to their home island. In the book, Faramir is actually wounded by arrows from the Haradrim, the Southrons, and they are also poisoned but it's not a Morgul wound, and Aragorn later comments that if it would have been an arrow from Minas Morgul, then Faramir would not have survived until the end of the battle. But being wounded only with the poison of the Haradrim, he actually does have a chance. This is actually also in the book, that they first throw in the heads of those that attacked um, the dyke in that case, um, yeah, the, the, the outer forts and not Osgiliath, but uh, first the heads, and then the stones, and then the burning stones. The amount of orcs that were said to have fought at this battle are estimated at 200,000. In the book, Denethor does not break down like that. But he still undermines the defense of the city by trying to burn Faramir and himself. So to get the sound of these pieces of uh, stone correctly, they actually had a one-ton piece of concrete that they let fall from a height of, was it 30 meters? Maybe, maybe probably only just 10. And they let it fall into the ground and they had microphones on the ground and dug into the ground that would record the sound as it traveled. And that's how they designed it in a way that it would sound real. Now you see Pippin here, taken off his helmet. Um, apparently the helmet that they made for him was really uncomfortable for the actor. And uh, so he took one of the chances of showing terror to just take it off and then he didn't have to wear it for the end of the shooting. Oh, the archers really don't have good form. Um, but what I actually wanted to say is 
the uh, the gate of Minas Tirith is one of the most uh, superb structures in Middle Earth, because it was forged by the Numenorians in the early days when they still were at the height of their knowledge and power. And um, so they show here how the normal ram, battering ram, doesn't uh, isn't able to destroy it. But in the uh, in the books, it's directly said that they have the big wolf hammer grond that uh, shatters it later. But not on its own. It's helped with evil magic, and it's actually the witch king who is standing there, uh, actively using his magic to destroy the the gate. You will not enter God. So for this scene, they had all the artistic crew, the cameramen, and uh, yeah, also Peter Jackson, the director. Everybody who was not normally on the set, uh, who was not normally in front of the camera, be um, be an actor here to this uh, to depict the Corsairs. In the book, it's Frodo and Sam together who go in there, and uh, Gollum quickly runs ahead and loses them. And they are then trapped in between Shelob and the web that you also see here. But the web is not sticky, and it is not white. The web is made out of uh, coiled ropes that uh, are so black that they absorb the light. And it's only because of the elven light that they can actually see what is around them. They can. Uh, make uh, Shelob be afraid and uh, drive her away and then they find out that Sting can actually cut cut the webs so that they can escape. It wasn't us. It wasn't us. So in the books what happens is that when Frodo and Sam finally escape the tunnel they're so so glad that uh, they survive that Frodo runs off while Sam is attacked by Gollum from behind. And so Sam has to fight off Gollum, which he manages to do uh, quite quickly. But just in the time that it takes Sam to deal with Gollum, I think he injures him with a cut and then Gollum flees, um, is enough for Shelob to sting Frodo and then uh, make him fall unconscious. The scouts report Minas Tirith was surrounded. The lower levels of flames. In the books, there's no way for the Rohirrim to get to Minas Tirith directly because there's a host of orcs um, at the border of Rohan and Gondor, or maybe even closer to the city. But um, there is there is this people of the du Duradan that actually help them by guiding them through a hidden mountain path. And that is why they can get to the aid of Minas Tirith unseen and um, against all the plans of Sauron. Gondor is lost. There is no hope for men. The tree in the book does not have a flower because the tree is completely dead and has been so since uh, I think the death of the last king uh, ab about a thousand years ago. But um, they find a sapling when Aragorn is king that is in the mountains because the seeds have flown there hundreds of years ago. Or die we must. In the book, in this scene, there's also the the cap the guard captain uh, under which Pippin has uh, has worked in the captain guard, in the city guard. He is barring the people who bring wood and oil and the the torches from getting inside, and he actually has to kill one of them because uh, Denethor tells them to kill the the guard captain. Um, He's the father of the boy with whom Pippin has a lot of dealings in the city. So here Frodo sees for the first time the tower of Kirith Ungar, and he notices that the the way where he is going is not as secret as he hoped. The scene with Shelob is really well made, because you, the movement of Shiloh are so, um, are just surreal and lifelike. And they had an actual funnel web spider in New Zealand that they put in a huge terrarium and put it in the center of the place where the de designers would, uh, I, I think it's just the center of where they worked, 
But um, nobody was brave enough to actually get close to the terrarium because they were all so terrified of spiders. So they tried to study it from distance as long as they could before they had to take a closer look. You see how rotten the head of Shelob is. And that is because she is so ancient. In the book, it's said that when Beren was trying to get through the added Gorgoroth towards Doriath, um, Shelob was already there and one of the spiders hunting Beren. That was six and a half thousand years ago. In the book, they actually say that um, Sun probably didn't wound Shelob mortally, he just injured her enough that Shelob was fr would flee. And um, there would be a big trace of slime that w uh, Shelob would drag behind her. So that the orcs would know that she was severely injured. And they would say that it was probably an elven warrior or one of the strongest of Gondor who would have fought there. Something that Sam notices with a bit of irony. Elijah Wood is really good at staring. Apparently he can stare for a long time without blinking, which makes him perfect for this scene. Also, now that Sam will take the ring, um, he will put it on because he is in danger of being seen by the orcs. And the ring en enhances his hearing quite a lot, so he can hear Shilop uh, bubbling and, and hissing in the background. And he is trying to follow the orcs and thinks he's quite close behind them, but actually they are quite far away and thus they manage to get Frodo into the tower and close the doors and Sam can't get in. This fellow I did. And that is the situation that you have at the end of the two towers. You only know of Frodo and Sam, that Frodo is taken and Sam cannot get to him anymore. And uh, then you have the whole story from the, um, from the perspective of the rest of the Fellowship up to the Black Gate. So when... Um, when the Lieutenant of Sauron shows the Mithril vest, or uh, Mithril shirt, they actually all believe he's dead, and you as well, because you don't know what happened up to that point. And it's after the Black Gate fight, um, or in the middle of the Black Gate fight, that you switch to Frodo and Sam's perspective back to Kirith Ungol and do all the story and then the rest of the book afterwards. I release you from my service. Here they had the scale double roll on the floor and then the actor of Pippin would just lie in front of the camera and pop his head up. Also, the person who is defending Faramir from burning, he is actually um, later sentenced by Aragorn. It's one of the first things that Aragorn has to do when he becomes king. And so he has to punish him for killing one of his fellow citadel guards. And he tells him that he is banished from Minas Tirith and may never come back. But he also orders him to join the guard of Faramir, who he, whom he so loves. And he lives with Faramir in Ithilien afterwards. This scene, uh, at least the confrontation between the Witch King and Gandalf, actually happens at the gate of Minas Tirith. And the Witch King is still on horseback. And it's when Rohan attacks that he switches to a fell beast. But there's no sign of Gandalf being defeated, and basically the confrontation is just stopped before it even begins, not like here in the middle of it. So there's a strong wind blowing at this point, which is removing the clouds that Sauron has sent from Mordor, and that is why you can see a dawn instead of having a long lasting darkness. And this is seen as a sign that the, the gods in Valinor are actually um, in favor of men and are doing a small bit to help shift the tide. Spears shall be shaken! Shields shall be... The speech that Theoden is uh, giving here was first thought of as being given at the end of the two towers when they are riding out, but they made a shorter speech for that occasion and then repeated the speech here. Also this blessing of the spears that Theoden is doing by touching them with his sword. This is apparently something that was done in some cultures. 
In one of the many documentaries, they said that uh, you can estimate how, how how much it takes for a horse in warrior gear at full gallop to stop, and they said they estimate that they you would um, hit about ten orcs before the horse stops, and so that is why um, a cavalry charge is so lethal, because it just goes through all the infantry without slowing down or just slowing down a little. And this is especially effective the closer the uh, horses are packed together, because there's no space to escape for the orcs. You may triumph in the field of battle for a day, but against the power that is risen in the east, there is no victory. So in the book, he actually shows that he has the Palantir, and he says that he has seen that the ships from the Corsairs were victorious because he has seen them going up the river and no host of southern Gondor remaining on the coast, which to him means that the battle was lost. And this is something that Sauron is showing him because um, that drives him to despair. And it's actually uh, Aragorn with the host of Gondor in the ships, which uh, Denethor does not see. And so the end of Denethor in the books is that he takes the Palantir and lies down and burns and it is said that later, whenever someone tried to look into the Palantir, they would just see the burning hands and nothing else. So it was kind of haunted and could not be used anymore. This back and forth in the battle, where you have first the orcs attacking, Rohan countering, and then the Haradrim coming, and then the ghosts countering. This is also in the book with some variances, but it's quite well captured here. The sound that they took for the feet of the olifants, well, it's, it's the normal heavy sound that they would use for an animal of that size, but they focused on the first two legs because they noticed that if they would, um, if they would create a sound for all four legs, it wouldn't work, it would sound like too much. So that is why you only hear the front two legs and then the charge happens and then from then it's chaos. <laughs> He doesn't shoot too badly. He has good form. Gamling is his name. For the fallen Oliphant, they actually made a life-size model. So they had these huge pieces of foam, because it was cut to pieces, that they then transported through Wellington, the capital of New Zealand, because they went from the fo uh, production area towards the field where they shot the Battle of Pelinor. 